We are grateful that you're an inclusive God. Lord, you're a, you are the God of the winds, but you are steady and true. You're the God of the waters, but you do not move around. You're, the plumb line of truth is there and calls us to yourself. I pray, Lord, for peace in our hearts, the peace that is in you. You are Jehovah Shalom. You are the God who uh, calls us to that place of rest, of uh, allegiance and trust. Father, every day we get the opportunity to spend time with you. And Father, more of you and less of us. I thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you'll use it tonight to speak to us personally. May we not just hear words and challenges from the, from the Bible. May, may we hear it to our soul. Father, sometimes we hear many sermons, but they don't challenge us. We just amen the truths that are there, but Lord, we need a fresh drawing to yourself. So Lord, this is your church, and we are your people. We know your voice. Speak to us tonight. Father, I thank you and praise you for those that have uh, found the desire to come and be in this place tonight. So, Lord, uh, may it be real and encouraging. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, open it to 1 Kings chapter number 17. We're going to begin a series on Sunday nights on the prophet Elijah. Elijah. I know some of y'all have studied him a lot. Some of you have studied him recently. And... Uh, this may scare some of you. We're only going to look at one verse tonight. Most people know that I do speak more from one verse than I do a whole chapter. But um, um, I want to kind of give a panoramic beginning. When you come to uh, the first time we ever hear of Elijah is in 1 Kings 17. But the very first word there is the word and. So that tells us it picks up on chapter 16. And if you read chapter 16, you go home and read it tonight, it is an ugly chapter, uh, a very, very ugly chapter. It is a chronicle of the kings of Israel to this point. Now, during this time, there is only one king in the southern kingdom of Judah. Asa was king for 41 years. But during this same time in, in the northern ten tribes that became named Israel, where Jeroboam led, led them away in that civil war there, and they, they, they um, began to uh, worship pagan idolatry. And it passed down from one king to the next and to the next. And, and, and this family of kings was shut off and killed, and the next one took over and they were shut off, and the next one took over. It was just abysmal, and it was terrible, and they all sought evil idolatry. And Omri became king, and he had a boy by the name of um, Ahab. And Ahab, oh my goodness, he was a terrible king. It said that he did more evil than all the kings before him, and he continued in this thing of idolatry, if you look back at the end of chapter 16 and verse 31, and it says that it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidian, Sidonians, and he went and served Baal. He served Baal. That meant his life saw Baal as Lord. <coughs> and it says <coughs> that he Ahab worshipped Baal. He bowed before Baal. He lowered himself 
as Baal as God, he as king under the authority of Baal as God. Verse 32, he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. So he built a temple to this pagan god, and Ahab made a woman a wooden image. Now, basically, this has been the, the thing throughout all the years. How could something that is made by the hand of man be God over man? He would put him in authority over man, though it has no authority, it's just dead, a piece of wood. Verse 33, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who went before him. All the kings before, his dad set the record, and he took it and went even further down that line. How terrible it was. We come to find out later in the life of Elijah, as God tells Elijah, there are 7,000 who have not bent the knee to Baal. And it's almost as if, hey, Elijah, there's 7,000. But let's just pause and flip that for a moment. Only 7,000 in all of Israel? Ten tribes? Only 7,000 with a million soldiers? Only 7,000 who stayed true to Jehovah God? Today in our world, we look at it and we say how terrible things are. And you could go through any time in the history of the world that where there seemed to be a bleak time. There's been some very dark, bleak times, folks. Some very dark, very bleak times. But yet in those times, God has still had people who haven't bent the knee to the pagan, but who have always bowed to holy God. There's always been a remnant. No matter how dark, no matter how dreary, you're not serving the God alone. God's got a group of people that are there with him. And please hear this. God wants to use those people. And God wants to use you. I don't care how bad this world may look. God still has a church. God still looks at it as his instrument of blessing to this world. And to this group, in this time, God introduces himself back again by the name of this uh, uh, prophet named Elijah. Now, let me, let me talk a little bit more about Baal before we talk about verse 1. Baal was the god, the pagan god that those people worshipped because they thought he was the god of nature. And that meant god of fertility, but that also meant the god of of, of prosperity and, and in an agrarian uh, world where you needed to grow crops, they looked to God to take care of those things. And, and we see that, that a, uh, Baal was called the God of rain. And the early rains came in what they would consider in their climate, October and November. The later rains would come in March and in April. And if you did not have the early rains, and if you did not have the latter rains, you would have no crop. If you had drought, that was the worst thing that you could have economically. It would affect everyone. So when God spoke, this was really God against the gods of this world. This is the God, the God who created all, over the gods created by the man's and the heart and the will and the hands of man. I, I have been a few places in the world, and y'all forgive me for playing with this thing, but last Sunday I had two different speakers who used it, and they just, abs I had it fit for me. I said that to someone this morning. They said, preacher, we need to get one for you and one for them. They can have this one. It's broke. But anyway, I, I apologize. If that's a distraction to you, I apologize. But I've been to cities, and, and in the cities in our world today, 
there's some amazing buildings, are they not? I saw a picture this past week of the World Trade Centers when they were being built. When all the steel was going up and there were the hollow shells as they were going up. And how, can you imagine the mind that thought that up? And, and, and thinking it through to say, this is what we're going to need to be able to do it. And the will and the collective group of people to come together to make it happen. Really a world in and of itself in those two buildings. But how quickly they fell to a pagan people who served a pagan God. But we see the things of man. We see the the will is what we try to do to change the world. People wanting to say this is what we need to do so that the world would be the, the type of world that uh, we need again, a good world. And there's really always, always some kind of a lot of, of possible truth in there, but it's, it, anything that's outside of bowing the knee before a holy God is on sinking sand. And the greatest desires without being for his honor and for his glory is usually for our honor and for our glory and our thoughts and that's what led to the fall and that's what leads to fallen generations and fallen people let me just begin as I uh, we talk about this verse tonight and I want us to think about what God would have in this place New Holland and what God would have in your family, some of you, your extended family, it would be your children and your grandchildren. And what I'm learning more and more of is great-grandchildren. Isn't that right, Polly? Amen. God continues to bless and to grow, but what is it God wants for you? What will you leave behind as a legacy? When God takes you to heaven, what are you going to leave behind as a legacy? What are you going to spend your time and your energy on? What are you seeking to build? Is it for you or is it for him? And in God's plan, and by the way, y'all listening? God has a plan. God's got a great plan. And believe it or not, God wants to use you to be a part of that plan. If I could point my fingers, at, I'm not shooting you, I'm just pointing at you. I mean, every one of y'all. I have to do it a lot in the corner. <laughs> Y'all hear me? God wants to use every one of us in his plan. And you may say, not me, not me, not me. Yes, you. When we see that first word in that verse, first uh, verse in chapter 17, a chapter that will change everything, a chapter that, that is a new day dawning, a, a, a revival among God's people, a a, a a line drawn in the sand and a great stance and a, and a time of boldness and, and, and a time of use. God says, I have someone and I'm sending him there. And his name was Elijah the Tishbite. During these dark times, he said, Elijah, go. The word Elijah means my God is Jehovah, or you may render it, Jehovah is God. Do you think that that's a coincidence at all? And look where he is. He says he's Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead. That means he was from the mountainous area. That means he was there among the rocky crags. He probably grew up as a young boy tending sheep. Much like probably, y'all remember David? The one who became King David, but he began as shepherd boy David, out spending time with God, looking at the stars at night, writing those psalms that, that the people would one day sing. Somehow doing his duty, but God doing a work in his heart and his life. And he wrote it deep within him. Before the circumstances of the world got to him, Listen, God got to him. And Elijah grew up much the same way. He was a Tishbite, a clan, just a small 
family among the mountainous people. In my vernacular, I would say this is a place that didn't even have a caution light. Amen? Y'all ever been through any of those towns that didn't even have a red light? They didn't even have a caution light? Praise God, they had a stop sign or two. But this is just a place you could say if you blinked, you'd miss them. This is where he grew up. This is where he lived. Among the smallest of the small, he probably lived a life much like the one that we link with him a lot, John the, the Baptist, the forerunner. You know what he dressed like and what he lived like? Elijah was probably the same way. You know, God sometimes calls the small and the insignificant, doesn't he? He goes down to the Ur of the Chaldees to call out an Abram. He goes to the place of Midian and finds a Moses. He goes to a place where religion had taken over the Sanhedrin, and he finds a Nicodemus. He goes to the Roman camp, finds a Cornelius. He goes to the smallest clan and finds a Gideon. He goes to the smallest town, Bethlehem, and births the Savior. He goes to a young teenage girl, a virgin, and calls her to be the mother of the king of kings. And yet, somehow we think we have to say, well, if it was someone else, but God could never use me. I'm not trained. I'm not educated. I, I don't have the ability. I don't have the personality. I could never. That didn't come from God. That came from you, or that came from the author of lies, Satan himself. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too busy. Be careful with that last one. You know, God doesn't use lazy people. He finds busy people. You say you're too busy, you're the one he's looking for. A fresh start. I don't know how much Elijah was known. But look what it says there. He says, as Elijah the Tishbite of the, land, of the inhabitants of Gilead, and it says that he said to Ahab, I mean, he just walked right up to the king of Israel and said, hey, brother, I got a word for you. We are told that when President Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States, during that time of the Civil War, you could walk straight to the White House and walk straight into the White House. And if you could find him there, whatever room he was in, you could walk in and have an audience with the president. I don't believe that would work today. Amen? I've been to that place. They got a fence around it. I had a camera at, on, on one of those tripod things, and I just set the camera down, and we were talking, and next thing I know, a security guard came over and said, you can't do that. I said, I can't do what? He said, you can't have that thing on a... He thought I had a gun or something in that camera. I don't know. Or maybe he was just, that was just the hard and fast rule that was there. I, I, I tell you, that place is covered up. And, and with our crazy world, it's probably a good thing. Amen? Elijah just walked straight up to Abraham and says, Hey, brother, I got a word for you. Look what he says. As the Lord God of Israel lives. I wonder what went through old Ahab's mind when he heard those words. Who? I hadn't heard that name Jehovah in a long time. That's that old time religion. What are you talking about? He says, as the Lord God of Israel lives. He's not dead. He's not made with wood. He's the God not only of nature, he's the God of all. And here I'm telling you, King, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. I, I know I may be standing in your presence, Ahab, but I want you to know I'm standing in the presence of God. 
that was born out of spending time with an almighty God up in the hills of the country of Gilead in the clan of the Tishbites. You know, you see, it really doesn't matter what storm you're going through in life. It really doesn't matter the storm that you're facing as long as you know the God of the storm. It really doesn't matter the question marks you have over your life as long as you've got the God who has the answers. It really does not matter if you feel all alone, if you have a God who's close to with you, who can whisper to your heart, who can whisper and speak truths. You see, it really does not matter if that person doesn't like you, if the king of kings loves you. It really doesn't matter what the doctor says if you have Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, who has another word. You see, it really does not matter what any circumstance of life may bring you if you know the God and you've been in the presence of the God who is the great I am. If you've been there, there will be something different in you. And what the world needs today is not social change. It needs a God change in society. I thought about this. We talked about the first Reformation. We've talked about the second Reformation. We've talked about all the places where study the revival that happened in Wales. And you'll see among miners where, where the gospel came. And when, when, when the people's lives were changed and they went back to the mines, the, the animals did not know how to obey because they had been cursed at so much. When they quit cursing, the animals didn't know what to do. When life comes in and life changes, society will have to change to God, not God change to society. We need a God that is real in us everywhere we go in society. There's something about us where we feel like we must pull out of society. God forbid we must go into society. We think that we're supposed to have a, a hallowed huddle here. That's just so where we can call the play and go out there and run the play. He had the boldness to walk up to the king and say, As the Lord God of Israel lives... Let me, let me tell you, brother, I got a word for you. Before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, except at my word. By the way, not going to rain, but let's just up it a little bit, not even dew. You're not going to go out on the morning and, and even see a little sprinkling of, of dew on the grass. I wonder what Ahab's face looked like. All right then. I don't think he was threatened, do you? At that moment, I don't think he was threatened. But what Elisha was doing, Elijah was doing, Elijah threw down the gauntlet. As the Lord God of Israel lives, he was putting, he wasn't saying just at my word. I'm standing in front of the King of Kings, and God's telling you, you old backslidden king, you, you got that ugly old wife Jezebel with all of her ugly per makeup on. You just think she's the greatest thing. You think that you're having all those uh, prostitutes out there, and you think that the wor that kind of worship is fun and good. You, you think this is what you want? Let me just tell you, there's something else out there. There's a holy God out there, and he's going to tell you he's coming at you right where you live. You got a, a God of rain? My God says it's not going to rain. Hold on, don't, don't miss this. There shall not be rain nor do these years. Y'all have that boldness? Brother Jimmy's here tonight. Love you, brother. One thing I knew about 
New Holland when I came here when Brother Jimmy stood up and said, it's been awful dry, we need rain. It was about to rain. Have y'all noticed that? About three times you stood up and said, we need rain. I think before it went home that night, it started raining. I know. I know. I wonder what it went like when days went by without rain. Hold on. Weeks went by without rain. Months went by. We missed all the early season and no rain. Well, we'll make it up in the, in the latter rains, but then they didn't come either. Hold on, an entire season without rain, no crops, and months went by. You think Ahab said, that prophet, Elijah, he probably rolled his eyes and didn't think too much of it until the word, listen to me now, y'all listening? Until the word of God came alive. Do you have the faith? Do you have the faith that believes that God, when he says yes, means yes? When he says no, means no? When he says go, means go? And you have the faith that believes the word of God and will act on it? By faith, you will act on it? By faith you will trust, by faith you will believe and go, by, by faith you will stand and not yield. Do you have that kind of faith? Are you listening? Or when the storm comes up, I, I think about when Jesus put them out on the water, the disciples in the water, sent them there, and the God of all heaven knew the storm was coming. But he wasn't worried about them. And when they saw him, they were afraid, and he said, it is I. Be of good cheer. That scared them even more. Do you have a faith that will believe that if, they, if God is there, all things are possible to him who believes. So much of our thinking is based upon the, the history of yesterday. If they were going to live in the days ahead based upon the history of yesterday, evil king after evil king after evil king, they had no hope. If all you're doing is living out your, your Christianity in the days of yesterday and you don't have a fresh word for today before whom you stand, the God in front of in whom you stand and you bow and you, you pray to and you read his word and you say, Lord, speak. Lord, help. There wasn't much urgency when Ahab heard Elijah speak until the days became weeks and the weeks became months and the months became seasons and it became years of drought. I wonder what droughts have arrived in your life. I wonder, have you ever questioned your obscurity, that God couldn't use you, that you're obscure. I wonder, what is it that you think God's wanting to do in your life? What is it that God is beginning to touch your heart in your prayers? What is it that continues to occur in your prayers when you're in your quiet time before him? God may be wanting to do something. Let me give you one last word. If there's nothing that God's been saying to you in your prayers, maybe you need to ask him to speak 
Maybe you even need to say, Lord, speak, for your servant is listening. Called into the presence of a holy God. That's where we are. That's where we are. 